Hello, everybody, and welcome to God Quest. We are going to have an outstanding time today. We have with us a very special guest that I have been looking forward to having with us, and that is Evangelist Mark Drost. Amen. Brother Drost, we are thrilled to have you on God Quest. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Young. It's a privilege and an honor to be here. I am excited about our conversation tonight. We have been discussing over the last few weeks. We've had uh, Brother Hemus from Liverpool, England. We've had Brother Nichols, uh, and we've had we've had conversations with Brother Sanders about the fivefold ministry, the miraculous. We've talked about the prophetic. When I think of the ministry of Mark Drost, my mind has to expand because you have been a part of such amazing ministry through the years. You, you grew up in revival. You have led revival. And your father grew up in revival. Your grand, The Dross family and revival are just kind of, you look it up in the dictionary and they go together. Amen. And uh, I had the privilege of being a kid right. with your family and visiting. Right. I, 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 we could go on all day talking about the stories. And right. I want some of those stories to come out tonight. But I am thrilled you're here with us on God Quest. And Thank you, sir. As, as we often talk about, God Quest is about us on this journey. We're, right. we're looking for what does God really have for us? And I know this is your heartbeat. Uh, you, you just preached tonight. We just came out of a power-packed service. Amen. And uh, God, God has used you in a particular way at our church and around the nation uh, amazingly. Uh, in places where people didn't think it could happen, that's only supposed to happen, you know, in the Philippines and right. Mexico and Colombia. Right. We're seeing it in the United States. And uh, j just kind of share, w when you think of revival, what comes to your mind? R revival for me, whenever I think of revival, um, I, I just said this just today, two of my favorite words is revival and fire. Mm because both are contagious. <laughs> and that's what revival is to me. It is something that becomes contagious. And so nobody's gonna go and watch something freeze up, but everybody wants to follow where the smoke is at and where the fire department is going because yeah. everybody wants to see what's on fire, what's burning. If a church gets on fire, the church will be attracting the neighborhood the city. And so it's contagious. You get people, you get a church on fire, they leave church and they start telling their friends about it. They're excited. They're, that's revival. It's, it's fire. It's contagious. And so whenever I think of revival, I think of revival, fire, fire, revival. You have, you have lived in incredible circumstances. Your family was in uh, Central America during war. Yes. And I have heard stories of, of how God provided safety, protection, and how in the midst of chaos, the hand of God was there that was facilitating revival, even in strong opposition. Right. Yes, sir. So, so what, what's, in, what's in your heart, what's in your mind when you think of, of obviously the world? We're seeing a lot of opposition to faith right now. Right. How should we be looking at the world from the viewpoint, okay, God, this is where we are, and you want us to have revival. What's in your heart as you're looking at this changing world we're in? We are at a, such a tremendous time of opportunity because as the world gets darker, the church should become brighter. Mm. Not... not Imitate the culture of the church, uh, of the world, but be the difference in the world. And so more than ever before, there is such a huge line in between what the world looks like and what the church looks like. Now, mind you, there are churches that are not having that line. Right. But apostolic churches, churches that flow in the apostolic, they are such a distinction from the world. And so it is, it is such a clear message for people to be able to see, okay, I see darkness on this side, but I see light on this side. Mm. I don't want this darkness. I want the light. And so right now, in the time that we are living in, 
the church needs to become more apostolic than it's ever been, more on fire than it's ever been, and more in relationship with Jesus. Because as the world gets harder to live in, where we're at the point where good is considered evil and evil is considered good, we've got to have our hearts and our minds in the right spot. Even if persecution comes, our faith has got to stand strong in all of that. You have witnessed revival in ways that many people will never get a chance to experience, largely because of the places you've been. Uh, God only knows how much you travel per year. Uh, you're seeing revival in different parts of the world, but in the United States. Could you illuminate for us uh, what differences do you see, say, in some of the places where where we've seen really what we would call big numbers of revival, but now we're seeing things begin to break in the United States. What differences do you see and what common things and what could help us in the United States? Because that's where the majority of us are, are at. What do you see us, what can we take away from listening to you who's, who's seeing revival in both dimensions? For many years, whenever you would talk about miracles, signs, and wonders, people would say, that's on the mission field. Uh -huh. That's only on the mission field. That, that doesn't happen in America. For the first time in all of my evangelistic ministry that I've been full-time now 13 years, okay. um, and of course I pastored before that, but for the first time in 2022, I saw more people get the Holy Ghost in the United States than what I saw outside of the United States. Wow. Outside of the United States in the Crusades, I saw uh, it, it was about 5,200 and some filled with the Holy Ghost internationally. In the United States, over 7,000 filled with the Holy Ghost in the United States. Wow. That to me was a shocker because I saw a turn around where before my numbers that I would get for people filled with the Holy Ghost internationally were way bigger yeah. than the national numbers. But there is a hunger in America. Now, this is another thing that I've noticed, and that is, okay, th this is going to be, I know some folks are probably going to tune off, so we're going to well, lose ratings God's right quest. now. So let's, let's go okay. on a journey. Praise God. Okay, so watch this. For many years, Europe was one of the least places to be able to have revival. Okay. Okay. Least yeah, places. I've heard it talked about many times. Cold. You can't have revival in Europe. You can't. All of a sudden, there were migrants that started to go to Europe, uh -huh. coming from different parts of the world, going to Europe and landing in that place. And all of a sudden, Europe broke out in revival. I was just there uh, a few months ago in Spain. Spain is on fire. Spain's on fire. Holy Ghost revival, people being filled with the Holy Ghost and everything. This year in America, people could say all they want, but over 2 million people came into the United States yeah. illegally. Yeah. Okay? And I was looking at that and I was saying, Lord, what is this? What's going on? And it was, I felt like the Lord was saying, I'm stirring up revival in America again. And he's having to bring outsiders to stir, stir, stir some folks that have been in the way so long that they're in the way, you know, <laughs> <laughs> just kind of get a fire under them because like I said, fire is contagious. And so if God could start bringing folks that are more hungry for the move of God, all of a sudden it's going to wake up a sleeping church to have revival. There is, there is a migration thing happening globally. This isn't just on the southern border of the United States. Right. We, we see this thing happening. And I know we could get into the political discussion of all that, but... But my mind goes to the book of Acts, right? where Paul is, is walking through and he's talking to them and then he stops and he says, God hath made of, of one blood all nations. Right. And then he says something that is often overlooked. He said, God hath determined, he hath determined 
the times appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Mm. And then he gives the clue. What that really means in modern language is he determined what time they were going to go and what city limits they were going to be in. Right. And the reason was that they would seek the Lord if happily he may be found. So the point I'm making is that I know we could we could look at all this through the lens of politics and, and, and nationalism and so on and so forth. And, and maybe that's another day we'll talk about that. But at the end of the day, God is setting up the place for kingdom expansion. Yes. We had a family uh, that had been in church the last three services that were part of some of the original folks that got out of, of Afghanistan. Wow. That were part of, they had worked and got out early. They have been in church. They've never been in a Christian church in their life. And I, I know everything about what's going on and, you know, as far as everything everybody would say about what's going on in that part of the world, what was done, and we could get in the political fight. But instead of looking at all that man stuff, Let's see where God's working in the middle of the chaos. Right, right. I believe there's real opportunity right now. Yes. What are, what do you think are some of the things that we could be more aware of in the United States? Obviously, there's an awakening taking place. You've seen more this last year, as you've stated. What are some of the, the things that you could point to that, that churches should be aware of that would help them as leaders and soul winners in this changing dynamic? Well, you've got to learn what is it that surrounds your church? What is it that's in that city? Okay. Like, for instance, most people, when they see Hispanics, they immediately label them as Mexican. Right. Immediately. Oh, they're Mexican, okay? So to try to relate to them, they're, they're, they'll always come up and be like, I like tacos too, <laughs> right? Or I like enchiladas, right? Okay, well, this is the problem. Not everybody's Mexican. No. <laughs> so if you walk up to a Salvadorian and you tell him, I like tacos, he's going to look at you like, I don't even know what tacos are because <laughs> that's not what they eat in their country. You, you deal with the Venezuelan. That's not what they eat in their country. And so you've got to learn what is surrounding your church because one thing for sure is immigrants will migrate together. They will, they'll okay. find their area. So there are pockets in the United States where you have pockets of Guatemalans, you have pockets of Hondurans, you got pockets of, of Mexicans, you, you have pockets. And so you've got to learn what pocket is around your church. If Let's say if you reach it out to like a Hispanic culture or what have you, learn what pocket is around your church. That way you can also learn how to minister to that pocket. What's interesting about revival in Latin America compared to the Latins that are in, Ameri in America is that in Latin America, they are rooted in their religion. And so for them to come out of their religion, it has to be solely out of hunger for seeking something more wow. for God. Okay? In America, the difference is this. They have left the land of their religion. Here they're looking for relationship. They're looking for connection. They're looking because they don't have family here. They don't have... And so if your church can become a place where they can connect, then that's where they're going to go. So like churches it. need to become more of a connect point for people that are immigrant instead of like, you know, putting the walls up or what have you. Be more relatable to the people that are coming and understand what's the culture that you're dealing with. And there you can meet those needs as well. Very interesting. I, I, I recently read a book, not a Christian book. Uh, the book was entitled uh, Silver, Sword, and Stone. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the head people at the Library of Congress uh, is a, a, a lady that grew up in uh, other parts of the world of Hispanic uh, origin and did a deep dive into Latin America. Mm -hmm. And... Basically, she put everything that's happened uh, historically in Latin America under three categories of 
silver, sword, and stone. Silver being the gold, the silver, the things that were taken from Latin America. And uh, I learned things about European powers and the wealth of Spain. And, and you know, a lot of people don't know that at one time, King Carlos's empire, the king of Spain, was larger than Alexander the Great or Julius, Julius Caesar. Oh, wow. And the reason was because of the gold and the wealth that was brought out of Latin America. Then she, she carried that all the way through historically, starting, uh, she covered Peru, uh, the Incas, the Mayas, Mexico, the list goes on. She, didn't, she doesn't focus just on one country, she focuses on all of uh, Latin America. Then she moves to sword. She traces the extreme violence that we see often in Latin America. Yeah. Where that came from, that's not a new thing. Right. And then, so that silver, that sword, and she gets into the whole, the government, uh, the Catholic Church with a priest and a conquistador oh, yeah. forcing religion and forcing oh, yes. conversion. Yes. And the impact that has, you add silver, you add the sword, and then the last thing was stone. Mm. And she brings out that the stone is the place of worship and those old pyramids and those old stones of worship. Here's what was interesting, and, and, and I, I want to hear your take on this. She goes through and shows how the Catholic Church came and built upon sometimes even taking the very locations and, and just kind of merging in syncretism or whatever. But she says now, she says, the new stone, and I was shocked, not a religious book, she said, the new stone is Pentecostalism. Mm. The growth of Pentecostalism, she said, now 40% of all the Pentecostals in the world are in Latin America. Wow. And she talked about why she sees it thriving. For me, I was like, I was, I'm in the coffee shop reading the book. I'm wanting to stand up and start screaming hallelujah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because now, the reason I bring that up is we see this radical revival taking place in Latin America. And now we're seeing, you just stated the numbers of revival. They, I live in a state now that is becoming predominantly Hispanic. Right. We see, I, I go back to the place I grew up in, Louisiana, and it looks vastly different than the world I grew up in. Right. And I see America changing. I see a real opportunity. Oh, my Lord, yes. In this nation yes. for revival. Yes. And I don't think we need to be afraid of it. Oh, not at all. And I think it's important that we hear from people that understand that world and take advantage of that. Yes. This is definitely the greatest moment for revival. This, the way we see that the culture is changing um, and, and everything, it's all connected to God's plan yeah. for revival. The same way, look, God used America to get the gospel around the world, but in the process, America got lost. America stepped away from God. America became uh, more worldly, more desiring the things of the world and everything to the point that now America has become the largest mission field. Absolutely. I remember when I moved from Mexico to the United States. You know my dad. Yeah. You know how my dad was, okay? Yeah. I said to my dad, I said, Dad, I'm moving to the United States. And he said, no, son. <laughs> We, we are a missionary family. Mm -hmm. He said, we are a missionary family. We need to be <laughs> on the mission field. And I said to my dad, I said, Dad, America is the new mission field. And he stayed quiet. And he said, he said, okay, son. I said, America is the new mission field. Because I knew that, that the Lord was bringing me to be able to see revival in the United States of America. And to be able to see in 2022, all of a sudden, the turn, where I see more people getting the Holy Ghost in the United States of America than what I saw on the mission field. That lets me know we're right now in the red hot moment of revival. And this is the time where either churches get on board or continue being bored. Hmm. This is the time where churches get on fire or they end up burning out 
Because God is looking for churches that are willing to move when his spirit moves. And even get out of our little, you know, tra- traditional boxes and stuff like that and accept people that we probably would have never accepted to come in yeah. and, and everything like that. Not accept their sin, right? but accept the soul to come in. Absolutely. And we be the ones to be able to set them free by the power of God. We are in a beautiful time for revival. Well, I appreciate you being with us tonight, not only here at the church, but I believe there is a, an awakening of fresh fire and desire. Yes. Especially in this generation. That the, the, world, the world is radically different than the world I grew up in. Right. But I was talking with my son the other day, our youth pastor, and he said something that shocked me. He said, Dad, you're thinking about all this stuff that has changed and that bugs you. (laughs) And he said, if you're not careful, your generation can get caught trying to fight what's already changed. He said, the young people I pastor have never known that world. Right. All they know is this world that has changed. Right. And he said, they're not afraid of it. Right. Because it's all they've known. Right. And I think we can make a mistake by not empowering these young people. Instead of us constantly saying how good it used to be and why, can we go back to the, why not empower them to say, you're big enough and bad enough because God is in you. Absolutely. Don't be afraid of this crazy world. Absolutely. And I'm watching young people thrive. And I appreciate so much what you have shared today. Uh, any parting words that you'd like to share with with a new generation that's hungering for real apostolic revival, wherever they may be? I don't know. I don't know why, but my mind goes to um, El Salvador, uh-huh. where there was a a moment where the government was establishing a uh, uh, what do you call that? Um, Oh, uh, the word for, uh, they said toque de queda, where it was after a certain, a curfew. They'd set a curfew, curfew, okay? And anybody that was out on the street after that curfew, they would shoot them. And then they'd ask questions. It (laughs) it was not like, who are you? And then they'd shoot you. They'd shoot you first and then try to figure out. Try to find the ID. Yeah. (laughs) So there was this church in a village where... Obviously, service went over the curfew time. So they decided everybody to, for safety's sake, they felt like if we all travel together to our homes, then we'll be more safe. Well, as they were traveling together, the guerrillas, the terrorists, came and surrounded them. And they made a mistake. They said, raise your hands. <laughs> <laughs> I can see where this is going. (laughs) And when they said, raise your hands, when apostolics raise their hands, (laughs) the next thing that comes is worship. Wow. They raised their hands and they began to worship. And as they began to worship, they started speaking in tongues. And as they began to speak in tongues, all of a sudden, one opened up their eyes and looked around. Gorillas were no longer there. Amazing. This is... I think this is why the Lord had this in my mind this whole time, and that is this. We are living in a time that instead of raising our hands, freaking out to the threatenings of this world, we need to raise our hands in worship in adoration to God and let God do what he does when his people recognizes his power. Wow. If we can get this generation to raise up without the fear, without that, that oh my God, I don't know, the, this world's going so bad, we can never reach it. It's, you know, if we can get them to have that confidence, that apostolic authority to say, we're not backing down. If, if the enemy wants to come and put us in a corner and tell us to raise our hands, it's our opportunity to be able to worship. It's our opportunity to get the, wor- the presence of God to begin to move. And if that can be our mindset, it don't matter what comes our way. 
we're going to turn it into an opportunity for revival and not an opportunity to kill us. What an amazing statement. Amazing. That's not coming from somebody that just read that in the book. That's coming from someone that grew up, saw that on display, saw the power of God. And for that, I am so thankful. For all of you that joined us today, I want to say thank you. I, I challenge you, listen to this again. Let faith build in your heart. Amen. Brother Dross, I'm so thankful you are with us on God Quest. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever you're going through in life, keep searching for the things of God. Make it your quest in life to find what God is doing because that's where real, real fulfillment is. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next time on God Quest.